This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm sure all of you came away from the symposium realizing that evolution, as Randy Nessie has repeatedly pointed out, is a basic science that's absolutely critical to medicine. So you're probably wondering why UCSD may be one of the only few schools in the United States where evolution is even taught as part of the curriculum. And it's not for any religious, social, political, or historical uh, 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 reason is really an artifact of the way medicine evolved. Medicine was an art that had a shotgun marriage with science in the 1920s and 1930s in what is called Western medicine. At that time, evolution was, was an established science, really, because we didn't know about DNA, the genetics was not yet known, and lots of other things were not known. So the new synthesis really happened only in, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, by which time it was too late. The curriculum had been jammed full of everything else. And so while Randy and others led the way in looking into this matter, I think it's going to be a lot more effort we have to take, which is more of an effort we have to take with our curriculum committees rather than a scientific issue to introduce evolution, uh, evolutionary biology more into the medical curriculum. So next time you go see your doctor, ask him, do you understand evolution when you're taking care of me? Okay, so with that, I'll uh, go to the question and answer session. We're going to start with questions for Katie Hine. First question is, come on out, Katie. If milk content varies based on the infant's gender, what's the signaling mechanism that tells the mother's body what this is? Is it prenatal? And if in the male and female twins, who wins? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, from dairy cows, uh, because of the management of the dairy industry, calves are removed from the mom at birth and they're fed a milk replacer. And uh, the, the milk that the heifer is producing is then used to feed us. And so from that, we can um, evaluate if there's differences in milk production. And if there are, that means that they reflect something about the prenatal environment. And indeed, in the dairy cows, we've seen that there is a signature of the infant sex from, from pregnancy. Uh, and we hypothesize that this has to do with hormonal transfer from the fetus into maternal circulation that then influences the functional development of the mammary gland during pregnancy. Experimental manipulation in bank voles 
in which they created all male and all female litters after they were born, has also shown that milk synthesis is upregulated when mothers are rearing all daughter litters. So there seems to be both prenatal and postnatal mechanisms that are influencing how the mammary gland knows that it's, it's synthesizing milk for sons and daughters. The twin question is a really, really good one. And uh, whoever asked that question, find me afterwards, and I will tell you, because there's work um, that I've reviewed that's now in press that gives us some insights into how uh, milk produced for uh, son and daughter twins may be different than what would happen if there were son-son twins and daughter-daughter twins, but I can't say from the podium. Thank you. Next is a question for Mike Gervin. Mike, come on out. Uh, do helminths reduce the incidence of atherosclerosis uh, to aid in their own survival because the host lives longer, so they can? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, there's nothing that worms can't do, apparently. Uh, no, it's a good question. I think, so there's a variety of ways, yeah, helminths aren't trying to, you know, make changes in our human bodies just for our own benefit, but, you know, they're, they're trying to ensure their own growth and survival. Uh, now, he intestinal helminths don't reproduce inside the body, but of course, you know, they lead to the shedding of, of eggs, uh, which will permit uh, to spread. And so, uh, there's a variety of different ways that helminths actually exert their effects. Uh, they're, they're taking uh, lipids, uh, consuming lipids and glucose from our bodies. They're altering the way that lipids are, uh, are metabolized. And so people with helminths tend to actually have lower uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, we've seen that in the Chimane, and it's now exists in other populations. And also, um, they modulate immune function in a variety of ways, as I mentioned, that are, seem to be regulatory and anti-inflammatory. And certainly, I mean, a lot of, you know, the solution of, well, maybe we all need worms, you know, it's a hard one to, to address, aside from the ick factor. Uh, right, your own body often can shed these, these worms. Uh, somehow evolution has decided that our bodies should tolerate them, as, as Russell said, uh, rather than get rid of them. Uh, and so, yeah, the dynamic is still trying to, we're actually still trying to work this out. Um, how helminths uh, uh, have co-evolved with our immune systems in ways that our body almost expects them to exist. Thank you. Um, one for Reverend Natterson. If chimpanzees are so closely related to humans, why do we use species like mice that are so distant as models for human disease? Well, that's, I mean, there are a number of ways I could approach that question, um, starting with the ethical or starting with the scientific. I guess my response quickly would be that we have been overall very disappointed with the, the mouse model in many ways. You know, it's often said that we've cured cancer thousands of times in mice, uh, but the problem is it doesn't translate so well to humans. I guess my comment would be um, that there are ways that we can begin to uh, advance science by looking at the natural occurrence of disease in non-human animals. Because there are limitations to experimental models. Don't get me wrong, experimental models are very valuable. And yet there's certain diseases, for example, bone cancer, osteosarcoma, which happens very commonly in large dogs like Great Danes and uh, Labradors and, and Mastiffs. And the biology, the natural history of these, this kind of cancer in those dogs is nearly identical to the biology um, in humans who developed this problem, typically adolescents. And so this is an area that we've really not looked at uh, and is hiding in plain sight, an opportunity to begin to understand and ask important scientific questions of uh, by looking at the animals all around us, not only our pets, but also wild animals, farm animals, who are on their own developing many of the same diseases um, that we have. As you can tell, we're doing questions for the speakers from before the break first, and the last is Rislin Mestitoff. Um, do you know or would you predict any effect of ketogenic metabolism on the outcome during a viral infection? And start by explaining what ketogenic um, metabolism is. So, um, so presumably, um, 
uh, what was meant as ketogenic diet, um, a diet that is uh, rich in fats and uh, uh, low in carbohydrates, um, similar to Atkins diet, for example. So the answer is uh, that it depends on the duration of the ketogenic diet and uh, how extreme it is, if it's uh, really only just fats and no, no carbohydrates at all. And, uh, and it depends on what is the uh, limiting factor during an infection. So we shouldn't be just generalizing it into any viral infection. It, even for a given viral infection, the limiting factor could be viral-induced damage or it could be viral-induced inflammation. Um, and uh, ketogenic diet, uh, or ketones uh, uh, rather, uh, have various anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and that can help under conditions when inflammation is the limiting factor. Um, but generally, being on ketogenic diet for long enough time, and if it's a very aggressive ketogenic diet, no carbohydrates at all, it, can, it has also various uh, side effects, such as uh, ketoacidosis, uh, which leads to um, a drop in the pH of the blood. And that in itself can have uh, various uh, effects that are can be deleterious uh, on the outcome of the infection. So this is a long way to say that uh, there is no simple recipe or as uh, somebody, when our study was published, um, somebody uh, asked me a question, how many candies should I eat to prevent flu? <laughs> uh, there is no answer like that. Uh, and. Um, I think the general, uh, only, only one general um, uh, implication I would say is that it appears that uh, our bodies may have preference for what we want to eat and what we want to avoid eating uh, depending on our condition. We all experience that and the indifference, I mean, it's most obvious in the case of an early pregnancy when the food preferences change dramatically. Uh, but that also seems to be the case with infections. So we have our preferences for chicken soup or honey and tea versus uh, uh, other types of food. And the, we think that these are uh, some ancient mechanisms telling us which type of metabolism would be protective. But anything extreme, like ketogenic diet or any, any one of those diets, uh, it's all, of course, much of it is nonsense and uh, we should just uh, follow a more natural uh, desires. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go to questions from the second session. A question for David Haig. It's a bit complex, but I think there's some interesting stuff in here. For offspring with defects passed on maternally, daughters may not suffer but will pass on genes to their sons who exhibit defects. Will defects in sons be less in the firstborn and more in the subsequent sons? <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of uh, difficult uh, questions there. Um, f first of all, the genetic defects we're looking at, you know, those are the mutations that Randy talked about that just happen and are bad and maladaptive, but they provide information about what the genes that aren't working um, do during normal um, development. So I wouldn't want to suggest that any of these defect conditions are adaptive in um, any sense. Uh, since I have the podium, I want to, well, I, I put something fascinating out there for you. Um, we now know that during pregnancy, that once a woman has been pregnant, um, cells from each of her offspring colonize her body and persist in her body for the rest of her life. And we also know that there are populations of maternal cells that colonize offspring bodies and remain in those bodies um, for, for the, often for the rest of the life. During pregnancy, a mother's mother's cells increase in frequency in her blood. And so there's the possibility that maternal grandmother's cells can colonize a fetus. And since cells from previous pregnancies are present in the mother's body. There's the possibility that cells of older siblings can move across the placenta and move into younger siblings. 
So these are all um, anecdotal observations that are out there, but I think it raises the possibility of all sorts of really um, things that we haven't thought about of effects within families if sometimes cells from the genetic individual of our siblings can be colonizing our own bodies. Thank you. Question for Cynthia Bell. Uh, does the difference between the Andeans and the Tibetans reflect the time in which they have adapted or is it the environment in which they have adapted? Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, to which I don't know the answer. I would add a third option to the time in the environment, and that is evolutionary history and microevolutionary history. It is the case that someone has been living on the Tibetan Plateau for much longer than someone has been living on the Andean uh, Plateau. So it's possible uh, that uh, given another 15,000 years, Andean Highlanders might uh, converge upon the Tibetan phenotype. The fact that we ha see signals of selection that are different in the two populations suggests that that is not going to happen. Uh, the question about differences in environment is an interesting one because uh, you, I think what you're doing is implicitly asking, well, you're focusing on high altitude and you're focusing on hypoxia, but what about could dietary differences, could latitudinal differences and ultraviolet radiation differences and infectious disease differences contribute to the patterns of differences? And the answer is yes, it's possible. We, we don't have any evidence. The third option that I introduced is that <clears throat> the population that gave rise to the Tibetan population came from northern eastern Asia. And that is also the population that gave rise to uh, Native Americans. And so it's possible that in the course of uh, moving from the old world to the new world, you know, there was genetic drift, there were new mutations, there were adaptations to other environmental factors along the way, so that the genome, the details of the genome that the Andean Highlanders took to altitude were different than that for Tibetans. And that would be a great question to sort out. Uh, and if the person who asked that is looking for a dissertation topic, go for it. Okay, so I think Charlie Nunn takes the prize for the maximum number of questions. Sleep, everybody's interested in sleep, but we can't really go through all the questions, but I'll give a sort of a combined question. One question which has two flip sides. One is, you highlighted the risk of short fragmented sleep, but what about sleeping too much, either because of uh, sleeping too much because you're lazy or because you get some drugs? Could that have an effect on cognitive deficits? And on the other hand, do the, the requirements of modern life, which are very different from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, actually require you to have more sleep? <coughs> Sorry, say the second one again. The second one is, uh, given the uh, stresses and, and environment of modern life, could it be that you actually need more sleep now than than the hunter-gatherer needs. Yeah, okay. Um, and well, these are really interesting questions, um, and clearly there's a lot that we still don't know about um, sleep and its effects on health. Um, the evidence that is out suggests that there's sort of a sweet spot of around eight hours. I mean, I think that's a, a there's probably a lot of error on that. Um, and that sleeping too little or sleeping too much uh, will, have, uh, will have health consequences, negative health consequences. Um, and so you, there, you know, it probably is the case that sleeping too much would also uh, contribute to some health, uh, negative health consequences. Now, I don't know a lot about that side of the equation. I think most people are focusing on the other side um, in, in terms of too little sleep. Um, and it's also interesting to think about whether uh, the stresses of modern life would lead us to need um, more sleep. Um, 
I, you know, I can't say that's really come up um, in a lot of our conversations. Um, the people we study in Madagascar, and I, I go to Madagascar with David to do the work. I have not yet been to see the Hadza. Um, but uh, when we go to Madagascar, those people are working really hard. You know, we're, of course, often there in the, the, the harvest season. Um, and they are, their, their activity levels are incredibly high. Um, we actually had the hypothesis that they might sleep more than eight hours, you know, because they don't have electricity. Um, and I think that there'd be an argument to say that they should sleep more um, than a typical Westerner does, just because of all the physical activity that they're um, undertaking, uh, hauling firewood, hauling water, um, you know, harvesting these crops, bringing the crops in. Um, they're really working hard, so I would actually expect them to need more sleep than a typical Westerner. Um, but I think uh, these are really interesting questions that we don't yet know, um, know, we don't yet have answers to them. So very nice questions, thank you.